Yeah, I saw them. Yeah. I saw them. I saw them. It, it makes a difference. I'm trying to like you, it makes my boy. <laughs> All right, guys, let's jump back to it. We got that squirrely little first digit that wants to be unique and be different from the other four. The thumb, the first digit. Did you have one thumb and four fingers? Has anyone else blown their families by with that yet? I already <laughs> asked you all that. You have one thumb and four fingers, not five fingers. You always get confused when you say that, but it's true. Now for that thumb, we have three positions. That being the AP, by the way, easiest way to miss a question on this test, because people are going to always want to choose PA because you're used to doing everything PA on extremities. The thumb is unique in that it is an AP versus the PA on digits two through five. We're also going to do the lateral, and of course the easiest oblique you'll ever do, the PA oblique thumb. AP lateral and PA oblique thumb. All right, so for the AP, we of course, just like everything else we talked about, we're gonna seat that patient at the end of the table. The handle will be an extreme internal rotation. You guys all did this in lab, yes? Where you turn the hand, you pull the fingers, and you move the thumb like this. Very uncomfortable. Try it on yourself. It's not the most comfortable position. Imagine your thumb is dislocated or fractured and you're doing that. Your patient's gonna be screaming and cussing you out when you do that. But Magic words, sir, ma'am, I need you to help me out. Let me direct your hand. Big, deep breaths. Let's turn our hand. Big, deep breaths. Big, deep breaths. You're doing awesome. Great. Look at me. Look at me. Awesome. You're doing great right there. Hold it for me. So I keep talking. That's how you work with patients that are hollering at you and screaming at you. You're distracting them. Big, deep breaths. Big, deep breaths. Work with me. You're doing great. You're doing great right there. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Keep talking. Keep talking. That's what we call extreme medial internal rotation. Posterior surface of the thumb will be touching the IR, and the MCP joint is what will be centered to the IR. It's where your thumb connects to that metacarpal right there, guys, the MCP joint. Not the IP joint. People make that mistake. It must be on the MCP joint. We're going to find out why in a second, because we actually include quite a bit more of the metacarpal of the thumb as compared to the other fingers. Now, what else is the thumb going to look like? The long axis, long axis of the thumb is going to be parallel. We're going to hold those other digits back with tape by the opposite hand. <laughs> Not what we see right here. This young lady is doing it with her hand automatically. You're going to need to tell your patients to hold those fingers out of the way because naturally, especially if they're older, those fingers will begin to curl and get in the actual picture. Hold those fingers out of the way. And then we're going to check that thumb position to ensure that true AP position. Leaving just a little bit of room for that marker on the corner there, as you can see. But nice tight collimation to maximize that image quality, that bony trabeculae, and now to visualize everything that we want to see on that picture. So once again, they're going to be hooting and hollering at you, especially if that thumb is dislocated. But remember that magic word, guys. I need you to help me out, sir. I need you to work with me here. I need you to help me out. It's psychological. Sounds like it wouldn't work, but I'm telling you that magic word works. Don't give them a choice. Remember we talked about that? What happens when you say, um, would you be able to move your arm in that position for me? What are no. they always going to say? No. no. Would I? <laughs> no. What you mean, would you, I? You cannot give patients a choice on that because they will tell you, no, there is no there is no way. There is no way I can move my arm in that position. And you've already lost them at that point. Has anyone accidentally said that yet? Would you be able to stand over there for me? Or can, can you stand up there for me? Yeah. It's okay. You can admit it. I've done it too. I'm telling you, if you say, I need you to stand over there for me. I need you to do this for me. I'm telling you, it works wonders. Central ray, once again, guys, the MCP joint, tight collimation, one inch to one inch. And we must include the majority of the metacarpal on that first digit x ray. That's different than digits two through five, where we only needed the head of the metacarpals, right? You remember that? There's a reason for that because the thumb has a very likely chance of having a higher rate of fracture rates on the first metacarpal as compared to the digit two through five. So they want to see that all the way down, typically to the CMC. Depends on your facility. But they typically want you to open that collimation down to the CMC on that first digit. CMC stands for what, by the way? Carpo metacarpal joint. And there you have it right there, guys. Can you see how that goes all the way down to the CMC on that x-ray? So the thumb, once again, is being unique. It's being different than the other digits. It wants to stand out, be a popular kid, be different than everybody else, not falling with the crowd. 
tip of the thumb all the way down to that first CMC is vital because once again, not only does the thumb have a chance of being fractured, but that first metacarpal has a very high fracture rate and dislocation rate right here as well. Now remember, with the joints, how's the thumb unique when it comes to joint classifications? Y'all remember that? Yeah. yeah. It's the only one that is a what? What kind of joint? The IP. The IP, but what else? It has the, it's the only one that has an IP, but what else saddle. is unique? Saddle. Is that saddle or cellar joint? Boy, is that a test question if I ever saw one. Mm. I love to ask that question. So is the registry. So once again, guys, distal tip of the thumb down to approximately the trapezium or that first CMC joint for that evaluation criteria. Just like the other digits, we want that concavity on both sides of each phalanx. That's proximal phalanx and distal phalanx only because the thumb only has a proximal and distal phalanx, not a middle phalanx. Like digits two through five. The pick up, excuse me. Ah, there we go. Coffee's coming up. Oh. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Equal amount of soft tissue on both sides of the phalanges. And thumbnail, if visualized, in the center of the distal thumb. Just like Aaliyah was telling you guys, they actually want to see the nails on these x-rays. Because they may see something in there. Maybe a foreign body, you never know. You can kind of see that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. No, like even the, like the, the soft shape. tissue. Yeah, the whole shape. Oh, the soft tissue, yes. Oh, around the nail, like even the bed and all of that. And there's a lot more tissue around your digits than people realize. Like you feel it, feel like there's just bone there, but there's quite a bit of tissue surrounding those digits. That's why I said you have to keep it all the way open, even if their nails are like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> you have to keep it all the way open. That's also why it hurts so bad to lacerate or break your fingers. There is a ton of nerve endings in your fingers compared to other parts of the body. If you ever had a paper cut, you know what I'm talking about. You ever had a laceration oh, like me? So oh. I always like to hear my stories. I got a story for you. Speaking of lacerations, so when I moved here to Houston, I had been working here for two weeks at Texas Children's. And you know, I was just a bachelor living by myself. I'd been living with mama all these years. I never knew how to cook. I didn't know how to cook, didn't know how to take care of myself. I had no idea what I was doing. Short, long story short. So I decided to make myself a homemade pizza. And you know, I was proud of my homemade pizza. It looked really awesome. I had it cooked and ready to go. Take it out of the oven, nice and crispy, beautiful cheese and pepperonis and meat making you hungry <laughs> but i did not have i did not have a pizza cutter you probably see where the story is going i did not have a pizza cutter but i had a very nice butcher knife and me um you know being the smart guy i was at the time decided to cut this pizza using a butcher knife instead of a pizza cutter because i didn't have one not because my finger was in the way and I went to slice the pizza like this, oh. and I caught the edge of my middle finger right here. Shunk. Put a huge laceration in my finger, um, cut it down almost to the bone. Didn't slice it off, but made a huge laceration right there on my middle finger. And I kind of, you know, like you, you get an injury, you just kind of like stare at it for a second. Like you, <laughs> you don't even feel pain, you just kind of like, um, yeah. And then it hits you. And then it hits me. <laughs> so then it hits me, and the blood squirting all over the pizza, you know. Yeah. Um, Does that look funny to me? So. <laughs> I was dating my wife at the time. I called her up and said, um, hey, Heather, you're gonna have to come drive me to the emergency room. <laughs> I just um, cut my finger trying to cut a pizza. She's like, you did what? Well, you know, I had a butcher knife, I didn't have a pizza cutter, and I almost severed my finger. Um, can you come drive me to the emergency room? She's like, yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I took a rag and I wrapped it around my finger. And um, the funniest part of the story is she always reminds me of this. She arrived and um, I had my finger wrapped up and I was eating the pizza while I was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, I was eating a slice of pizza when she walked in. I was like, yeah, um, I'm ready. Let's go, let's go to the emergency room. Yeah, that's all I was about to say. I ate around the blood. I ate around the blood. I didn't eat the blood. I'm not a, I'm not a vampire. I ate around the blood. But anyway, anyway, the reason I wanted to tell that story was because when I got to the hospital, actually the laceration didn't hurt so much, but when they went to stitch my finger, that was like, they should have given me something to bite down on when they did that. I thought I was going to climb up the wall. Because they had to put like two shots into my finger, like under the nail, to deaden it. And I was, ooh. If you've never had a shot in your finger, that's like level 10 pain. That, that, was, that was intense. So they stitched it all up and um, I had a Frankenstein finger for work for like a month. Everyone was picking on me at work too, so... Uh, I was doing x-rays with this gigantic <laughs> bandage on my little finger. It's like, like, can you move your, don't touch me please. <laughs> but it hurts a lot to, um. I don't think it hurts that bad as getting a shot in your eye. Your, 
shot in your eye. Oh, oh, like, oh, oh, like, oh, like, 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 Yeah, so they had to reopen it. So they had to undersee, put anesthesia on my eyes. So that was really crazy. So God just hurt so bad. Like it hurt so bad. That does hurt. Just because it's so thin. Oh. Yeah. You gave the needle in the eyelid or the eye. I had several questions, but they weren't necessarily important. Let's move on, guys. Back to the AP thumb. That little distracting story there. What else we want to see? Of course, the open IP and MCP joints specifically. You'll notice it does not say the open CMC joints, but we do need the CMC joint on that X-ray. The open IP and MCP joint spaces. Now, there are some cases when it comes to doing these X-rays where a PA thumb may be the only one that we can get. Why would that happen? Let's say there's a really bad laceration on the back of the thumb. We could not lay that thumb down on the posterior surface. Thus, we need to go ahead and do a PA. But that would be a last resort. We're always going to opt for the AP or the PA unless you just physically or cannot handle the pain of an AP. Make sense? If we do a PA thumb, there is going to be the increased OID causing that magnification, which is why that would not be an optimized ideal x-ray. But we're still going to get the best image possible based on what we can work with. But do not give them the option for that. See if they can do that AP first. It's just absolutely impossible. Document and opt for the PA versus the AP. Make sense? What's wrong with that x-ray, by the way? Digital marker. Digital marker, thank you. Big no-no. How's the rest of it, though? Not great. Not too bad, right? Pretty good detail, nice centering, should nice they, positioning. Should they have adjusted their mass? I think that's pretty good. I just might be the quality of the image I put on there, actually. Is it the joined Right there, yes. Lateral thumb, not too bad, guys. Not too bad of an x-ray, why? You can just turn the hand like this and you're automatically in the position. Tell them to give you a thumbs up, put it down like this. Thumbs up, lay it down. You're in a perfect lateral for the thumb. Palmar surface will still be in the IR. Do not count on those sponges because you're not gonna have them. I wish I could say we did, but we do not. MCP joint will be centered to the IR and that center ray will also be once again airing the MCP joint for that x-ray. Please make note of that once again, that's airing the MCP joint, not the IP joint. Because remember your digits two through five, it was the PIP joint that we were doing the central ray, correct? The thumb is gonna be that MCP joint, why? Because we gotta include all the way down to that CMC joint. Very vital for that thumb x-ray on all three views. The biggest mistake people make on lateral thumbs is they fail to get the fingers out of the way. Make sure that if you're putting them in the lateral that you're moving digits two through five out of the way. Depending on how gnarled up their hand is, those fingers can get in the way. Make sure you move them out of the way or have the patient hold them out of the way. They don't obstruct what you're trying to see. The star of your show is that thumb only. By the way, when it comes to the thumb, another difference with thumb x-rays versus digits two through five, they will often not opt for a PA hand because the thumb is unique. So we're going to do that AP, oblique, and lateral view of the thumb only. Fingers, a lot of the protocols will call for that PA hands, but not necessarily the thumb. Make sense? Yes? Yeah. And you're noticing that nice, tight collimation still, right? You want that whole hand on there. What do you want to see on that lateral thumb? Same exact thing, guys. Tip of the thumb, which is that distal phalanx, all the way down to the trapezium where that CMC joint is located. We must have a true lateral. How do we confirm a true lateral? The thumbnail, if we can see it, is gonna be visualized, normal, and in profile, nice thin shape. We're gonna have that concave anterior surface of the proximal phalanx. Once again, concave means that it curves inward. There's that anterior surface we see right there. And of course, no rotation of the phalange itself. Still want those open IP and MCP joints specifically, not CMC, IP and MCP, and our nice trabecular detail. What else can we see on this x-ray? Y'all remember what that's called? Sesame. That's your little sesamoid bone, that's correct. Very good. Also, you have a little indentation here, guys. You can feel it on your hand. If you put your finger right here, if you bring your thumb up, wiggle it, put your finger right here, you'll feel like a little indentation. That's where that CMC joint, I'm sorry, yeah, that's where that CMC joint is, not the, the radiocarpal joint is located. I apologize, the radiocarpal joint down here 
where the radius connects to your carpal bones. That's also a nice little searing point for that ulnar deviation close to your scaphoid. But what my teacher used to always call that was the snuff box. You ever heard of the snuff box? Yeah. Some of y'all heard of the snuff box? You all know what snuff is? Mm-hmm. Chewing tobacco? Mm-hmm. Um, according to my teacher, they used to stick snuff right there. and I don't, I don't know if that's true. You shouldn't put your snuff right there in a little snuff box. Oh, I thought you were going to say that white line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, that's like stuff. Jamie yeah, that's what I say. You can put the, the, the snuff box. box. Yeah. Oh, the snuff. The white line yeah, right there. Like the sniff. <laughs> yeah. It's like sniff box. Um, well, <laughs> we're not going to promote the sniff anyway. <laughs> <laughs> little cocaine box. Yeah. No, we won't go there. We won't go there. Oblique thumb. The easiest oblique you will ever do in your career as an expert tech. Why? All you got to do is have the patient relax their hand on the cassettes. And guess what? The thumb is now naturally in a 45 degree oblique. It can't get any more easier than that, right? You don't have to adjust it. You don't have to move it. It sits naturally in a 45 degree state, which is very nice. One of the easiest x-rays. That's the one you want to draw for your test out right there, guys. Yes. <laughs> Paul bar surface will be on the IR. We're going to slightly on our DD the hand, although that's not completely required. You can just turn the cassette to match the angle of their hand. Just make sure the thumb is nice and straight. By the way, great point to make. Where's that cassette? I want to demonstrate this for a second. On these digit x-rays, make sure you're lining them up with the long axis of your IR. Don't put the thumb like this and then turn your tube and collimate, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. You wanna make sure that you have the hand like this so the thumb is lined up with the long axis of the IR. That way it hangs properly on the film. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Not like this, they want it like so. Same with any of the digit x-rays. Make sure it's nice and straight on that cassette. You will see lazy text putting it randomly on a cassette anywhere. You don't wanna do that. That looks sloppy and doctors can recognize sloppy x-rays. I know I can. No. You, you, we're always working to optimize the quality of the x-ray and optimize it by matching the long axis of the cassettes. That's a very minor detail people will overlook, but it's very important in making you stand out as a quality x-ray tech. Because you got techs that don't care, they just throw that digit anywhere on that x-ray and it's all cattywampus. New word for you, cattywampus. It's all cattywampus on that cassette and it just, it just looks sloppy. It looks very sloppy. Correct. So no matter what part, what no matter what part central ray, no matter what part we're talking about, you always want that digit or that upper extremity to match the long axis of the IR. Keep that in mind. You're going to see some weird stuff out there that techs do that's not considered optimal quality. Central ray, guys, perpendicular to the MCP joint still. That has not changed. And guess what? Evaluation criteria is exactly the same overall we want. Tip of that distal phalanx all the way down to the trapezium, including that CMC joint. And we still want the open IP and MCP joints. So what can we say about the thumb? All three of those x-rays, we want open joint spaces. Even though obliques will open them up the most, we still want to see them open as much as possible on all three views. Nice concavity on those anterior surfaces once again. Equal amount of that soft tissue on either side. And that's another way we can see that little sesamoid bone again. Are there two there? There is two. Good eye. It's a small one and a large one. Can you feel it? Like if you have it? The sesamoid bones? I've never felt one. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe you don't have it if you don't feel it. I mean, I think almost everyone has a sesamoid bone on the thumb. You can get sesamoids on all your digits, by the way. It just depends mm-hmm. on how much you use your hands. To increase friction will increase the chances of having sesamoid bones, but I'm not sure if you can actually feel them. I'm not, I don't know. I know. It's very prominent, I suppose you could. How many uh, total would you say that this thumb has? Sesamoid bones? Yeah. There's two. There's two. There isn't any higher up on the. I don't see any. I think if you turn it to a lateral, you could probably see it on the portion. Because I can see what you're saying too. Okay. I see it. I wasn't sure about right here. Yeah. And then okay, inside the, the joint capsule as well. That's a sesamoid bone or just the shape of the um, head of that middle, or I'm sorry, that proximal phalanx. So they just might have like a another process or. Could like be. You'd have to see thing. the lateral, like she said, okay. to confirm that. 
Because like I know some people have extra teeth or whatever, like growing off the side. Of their they teeth. do. They do. This is some weird stuff. Yeah, Lots of variances. All right, review question here, guys. Where does the center ray enter the third digit for the PA projection? Third That's where you got to be careful. The third oh, yeah. PIP. PIP. Remember, third MCP is going to be for what? The hand. PA hand. That's why I said be careful on those. It's easy to mix up. For your digits two through five, it's that PIP joint. PA hand is going to be MCP joint. But also, the thumb is going to be that MCP joint. Keep that in mind. Where does the collimation extend to approximately for the AP projection of the first digit? One inch to the first inch. Or first ring of the What was that word I said on every one of those projections of the thumb? That first CMC. It's for the first digit. So you always want to include all the way down to that first CMC. That's vital. For the thumb only, though. For the thumb only. Thumb is unique like that. All right, let's move on to the hand as we wrap up today's lecture, guys. What are we going to do for the hand? Of course, a PA, a lateral, and a PA oblique. But keep in mind, for the hand, we have two different types of laterals. We have what's called a lateral extension and the fan lateral, which you guys should have done in lab. Um, did you guys discuss in lab why you would opt for either one of those? Like, what's the difference between those? What would you, why would you choose one over the other? Anybody know? Like if the patient can't do the fan. Isn't like the fan can see more of the the fan is a fan of the phalanges and better visualize the joints. The extension is primarily usually done for foreign body analysis. Like if there's a foreign body in my hand and I need to see how anterior or posterior it is, I'm going to put my hand in a lateral extension to be able to visualize where that foreign body lies in the hand. Not the only reason we do it, but that's the primary purpose for fan, I'm sorry, lateral extensions, foreign body location. And you said if they couldn't move their hand, yeah, that would yeah, be an option yeah, as well. Said, yeah. like if they just cannot move their finger in the position, <coughs> you can opt for the lateral extension, but the doctors usually won't like that too much. Yeah. Once again, what do we tell them? Suck it, suck it up, buttercup, get your fingers in position. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't say it that way, but use that magic word again. I need you to help me out, sir. I need you to move your fingers in this position. Make me an okay symbol. Put on that cassette. All right, so guys, we are still seated at the end of the radiographic table. That has not changed. We want to adjust that table's height so that the forearm and the humerus, I'm going to add, is nice and resting on that table. You don't want the arm straight out, by the way. It's better to have them sit sideways like this young lady here and put that elbow at a nice 90 degree angle. It's going to optimize that position for you. Not that sticking the arm straight out is incorrect, but it's a little bit better when you put them in this position right here, and especially it's better comfort-wise. For them. It's a little bit extra support on that upper extremity, especially if they have a lot of pain in that hand or that wrist. For the position of the PA hand, palmar surface is nice and flat on the IR, forearm on the table. We're going to extend and separate the digits to prevent soft tissue overlap. You will see a lot of techs put the hand just like this. That is incorrect because the soft tissue will overlap the phalanges and possibly block the bones and the bony detail we're trying to see. You need to separate the fingers. Not super wide, but slightly separate them. That's going to give you a nice, distinct view of each separate finger, as well as all the metacarpals, the carpals, all the way down to that distal radius and ulna. <clears throat> We're going to center that third MCP joint to the IR, because that's where our central ray is also going to go. And of course, lay your shield on the patient's lap. Don't forget to do that either. That's the same face y'all start making in the lecture when y'all falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the eyes start to get a little heavy. <laughs> y'all think I don't know this, but I see a lot more than you think I do. They be looking like, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Look, she's pointing at shoes on. You're like, who, me? <laughs> This actually looks just like a teacher used to work here. Her name was R.T. Patel. This looks exactly like her. R.T.? Like R.T.? R.T. Patel. 
All right, set your ray directly on that third MCP joint. You can palpate that yourself, guys. You can feel that joint like the little indentation on your finger. Nice little target point. I mean, once again, guys, easily palpable. Make sure it's directly on that MCP. Otherwise, you're going to risk cutting off carpals or tips of the fingers. Make sure you're not on the PIP. Biggest mistake I see on PA hands, they center too high on the fingers. It must be on the third MCP specifically. Nice tight collimation, guys. Make sure that you are including all five digits from the tips to the sides. And you do want the entire wrist on that x ray. In fact, on the evaluation criteria, you'll see that you do need to have at least the distal radius and ulna on that x ray. Don't need the whole forearm, like some techs <coughs> tend to do. That's just sloppy x raying. But you do want that distal radius and ulna. If you're doing PA hands and getting the whole form on there, yeah, it's time to switch careers. That's just sloppy. Y'all hear uh, Evan Tom open it up? Yeah. Open that collaration oh. up. <laughs> it's the bane of my existence. You might clip something. my mouth shut when I really think about that. I thought this was a safe place. It is, but you know, there's some things I'm going to keep to myself. <laughs> All right, what do we want to see? What structures, what evaluation criteria? Once again, fingertips to the distal radius and ulna. So yes, you do want radius and ulna, all your carpal bones, all five metacarpals, all five phalanges, and your fingertips on that x-ray. Once again, we must slightly separate those digits. We don't want any of that soft tissue overlap. And how do we check for no rotation of the hands? Be careful, by the way, when you rest that hand down on the cassette, especially if they're in pain and you're separating the fingers, if someone's hand really hurts or they have arthritis, what do you think their hand's gonna naturally do? It's gonna start to raise up or they're gonna curl their fingers like this. It's gonna start to oblique the hand. Make sure before you take the x-ray is nice and flat, it's vital. Um, always do that double, double check before you is that the x-ray. So equal concavity of the metacarpals and phalangeal bodies on both sides. Got that nice curvy shape that we're talking about. That equal amount of soft tissue on both sides of the phalanges. Fingernails need to be in the center of each distal phalanx and then equal distance between the metacarpal heads. That's this area right here. Equal distance. Except for the second and third. That's a little bit more distance there. Really great picture there, by the way, guys, showing you all those divisions, your carpals, metacarpals, your phalanges, all those joints. I think we talked about last week, your radius and ulna. By the way, where are those two little spikes on the radius and ulna column? Styloid processes, very good. Oh, we got a review because we can see it, guys. Let's let's go. You already know what I'm about to do. I already know. What is this? Scaphoid. Scaphoid. Did someone say tripetrium? <laughs> tripetrium? Trapezium. Trapezium. Then. And then what's that little tip there? Be careful. Be careful when I when you jump around like that. Be careful. Do you guys have with the MCP and CMC, like the difference? Yep. No? Yep. So, how I remember it, these are the carpals, right? So, it starts with a C, that's CMC, so this is right here. And then, these are the meta, uh, metacarpals, right? So this is gonna start with an M, right? So, MCP. That's how I remember, because on the test, he's gonna ask you, and he's gonna, it, it, it gets a little tricky, because you're like, oh, CMC, oh, CMC. I'm telling you right now, that's a that's a test question. <laughs> I was like, I was on the test like, oh my gosh, wait. So I literally drew out the hand. Yeah, that like helps a lot. Draw out the hand and let, label your hand. That's why I didn't use CMC. I was like, oh, okay. You see, I remember that. You want my secrets away. And you miss CMC. Give me the secrets away because that's what I, I mean. You know, I'm gonna teach you too. No, it's all right. That's all right. <laughs> so make sure you guys understand the difference between those two. You got a question, Shaheen? Yeah, I think that CMC is just that 
That's one joint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so there's five. Yeah, it's where, one, two, it's where three, the base four, and the carpals. Do you see these are the bases and these are the carpals? So it's right here. All of these. These are CMCs. It's MCP. Again, MCP is five joints. Mm -hmm. And ten for both are healthy. Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, so we're at evaluation criteria, guys. So even though the obliques do optimize joint spaces, we still, even on the PA, want to see open MCP and IP joints. That's including the DIP, PIP, all together when you see IP joints. That indicates that the hand has been placed flat on the IR. If we see these joints closed off, that tells us that the patient probably relaxed their hand. It's not nice and flat. So there is a reason to have that hand flat, to keep those joints nice and open. Or if they have extreme arthritis and they've lost joint integrity, that'd be another, another reason those joints would be closed off. And your bony trabecular detail and your surrounding soft tissues. Yeah. You see the fingernails pretty good on there. Y'all see the fingernails? No? Look, there's the thumbnail. Right above the profile. Can you see it? There's a the fingernail. Maybe the light would be off. Look at the TV screen. It's a little more HD. You can literally see the shape of this. Oh, I can see it too. That's why it's important to get the whole thing out. Oh, so it's important to clean your nails. I don't see all that nasty stuff on your nails if you don't clean them. <laughs> Seen some ratty fingernails. The girls with the, the jewels. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the PA oblique hand. This is going to be a 45 degree oblique. Once again, easy number to remember. We're used to that 45 number. 45 degree oblique. Once again, I'm sad to say, guys, as man, this is what I used to have at TCH for that kid took a bite out of it. <laughs> this little staircase, called the staircase sponge. Each finger goes on a different step. It puts that hand in a nice, beautiful 45. Unfortunately, we do not have this to rely upon. So what can we do? What I just showed you with the fingers, okay symbol, separate the second digit, you're in a nice 45 degree oblique, just like she's demonstrating for you right there. Puts it in a perfect position for you. Very important that we get that true 45. We need those digits nice and separated. If we're not in a true 45, we're gonna get some overlap of that tissue. You want those digits completely separate so you can make out each joint individually. Slightly extended on the sponge or parallel to the IR. Once again, that's going to demonstrate all those IP joints because once again, the primary reason that we do obliques on extremity work is to open up joint spaces. I keep saying that for a reason, by the way. It's also going to prevent or shortening of those phalanges. And then the MCP joint in the center of the IR, specifically that third MCP joint, which we will still be centering to just like the PA hands. And I got an Easter egg for you guys I will say um, that is a technique I've seen people do, but curriculum-wise, make sure you're doing it like demonstrated on the textbook right here, because the registry does not honor that position with the extended fingers, unfortunately. Well, because it's good to know foreshortening versus elongation, but mm -hmm. curriculum-wise, it's considered optimal the way, I sh the way it's showing you right here. Is that Von Traeger as opposed to Nettles? Yeah, don't, oh, we, don't, we don't speak about Von Traeger. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Montrager. <laughs> <laughs> she's um, you know, she's she's coming off of that. She's in the recovery stage off of the <laughs> Montrager trauma that she went through. Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, central ray guys, still at the third MCP as you see right there, and you'll notice it looks like quite a bit of light on the side there, right? You have to adjust that accordingly. Um, be careful when you're collimating. Make sure when you bring that collimation in that you're not cutting one of the digits off. So it looks like you have a little extra light on the side, so that's okay, depending on what position the hand's in. You have to make sure that we have the first and the fifth digit on that x-ray, though. Very easy to cut those off if you're not paying attention. Third MCP. Notice the marker is on the lateral side. Not a huge deal, but considered more optimal to put it on that side. Wait, is that the lateral? 
Yeah, that's a medium side. That's not a lot of medium. I'm sorry. You have a medium, uh, anatomic position, yeah. eagle side. See, I mix it up too sometimes. Is that Bond Trader? Bond Trader, man, yeah. All right, what do you want to see? That's a nice, pretty oblique hand. Aside from the image quality being a little bit ugly, that's some beautiful position right there. That's what we want to see. Nice, open joint spaces. We still want to see the tips of the fingers all the way down to that distal radius and ulna, so the entirety of the wrist is on there. Digits must be separated with no overlap of their soft tissues, preferably. 45 degree <coughs> rotation. How do we check for 45 degree rotation? We look for what's called decreasing amounts of separation between the metacarpal bodies two through five, right here. With the second and the third, right here, having the greatest separation. Do you see the difference? There's much more separation between two and three versus these two spaces right here. This is the main one we want to see separated. Two and five, I'm sorry, two and three. And then partial superposition of the third, fourth, and fifth metacarpal bases, which you see right here. And the head slightly, mainly on the bases. That's how we can tell it's in a true 45 degree oblique. Marker. Y'all still writing? <coughs> yes. Sorry. Nice eyeball. Thank you. <coughs> you do a lot of artwork? Uh, it helps me like stay focused. I used so to do that too in class. I get it. If uh, like, I feel ADHD kind of kicking, you just channel it. I usually doodle when I was bored. You know. I've done that. Like, like, don't tell me if you're bored. But, you know, feelings. I'm not bored. If I had any feelings to hurt, it would hurt my feelings. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, and then some more structures we want to see, guys. Once again, open MCPs and primarily those open IP joints. So once again, the 45 degree oblique is going to be the most optimal position for opening up those joints we've been talking about. You know, you want to see on all three views is the most optimal in a 45 degree oblique in regards to opening up the MCP and IP joints. So that's kind of showing you a more optimal position hand versus suboptimal. If you look really at the distal phalanges up here, this hand is probably over rotated, more like a 60 degree oblique. Look at how the joints are closing up here compared to the image on the left. Can you all see the difference? Mm -hmm. That's why it's very critical that we put that hand in a true 45 degree oblique because just a slight, slight over rotation or under rotation will close off those vital joints that we want to see. Even the thumb, see? IP joints closed. MCP closed. Are we also looking at the joint spaces between the carpals? These here? Yeah, and like the CMC. Not exactly. Um, when we're doing our wrist x rays, we'll talk more about that though. How we separate those. Is that, that's more like not touching the body? The, it's in here? Yeah. Not touching the, the bone? It does, well, the sesamoid bone is slightly separated from the metacarpal, naturally. Like a lot? Or like it's not a lot, but there's like a little bit of a space there, a little joint space, a little connection space. It's probably like blanket bits or kind of old, it's almost 10 o'clock. All right, guys, we'll stop there today. We'll pick up with the lateral hand on Wednesday, of which Ms. Hawkins will be teaching y'all, and I'll be helping as well. We'll be team teaching. Are there any questions on today's lecture? I do have a question. Yeah. Like when we did uh, lab, like your way, uh, Mr. Fong, I think he had us just turn the hand like that. Is that okay? I'm going to talk to Mr. Fong because Merrill's is not under that position anymore. Okay, so we do the. Yeah, I'll talk to him. Okay.